Happy third Sunday of Advent. We're glad you've chosen to worship with us this Sunday. The first two Sundays of Advent, we lit candles, one representing hope and one representing peace. Today, we light the third candle, the candle of joy, which is often depicted as pink or rose-colored. In Latin, the third Sunday of Advent was traditionally called the Rejoice Sunday. As a break from the heaviness of Advent's preparations, this Sunday offers a reprise from our dark longings to offer joy's glimmer of light. And I don't know about you, but right now in the midst of a pandemic, in the cold of winter, we all need the reminder of joy. So may we remember to rejoice. Maybe today you can put on something that's pink to be reminded of that joy that comes and the promise of the joy that comes with the second coming of Christ, but also the one that has already come in the baby. Will you join with me in our reading? Joy can be found amid the season's festivities and gatherings. We see the joy in the children, the lights, the gift giving, the music, and the spent time with family and loved ones. Yet sometimes the season can remind us of what we do not have or what we have lost. We admit the joy of the season can get lost in the business and the darkness of long winter days. Though the context in which the biblical Hebrews lived was one of poverty, poverty and oppression, God's people still rejoiced because their hope was found in God's love and promises. Through the complexity yet simplicity of the birth of a baby more than 2,000 years ago, we have been given the extravagant gift of Jesus, the child of joy, our deepest treasure. So as we wait together with hopeful expectation, may we rejoice for Christ has come, Christ is here, and Christ will come again. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for the reminders of joy that even when our life circumstances can be filled with darkness and even haze, that you give us a sense of clarity, but also a sense of joy, knowing that your promises are true. May we continue to hope for your promises, and may peace be a reality in our day so that we can dance in the joy every day. It is in your name that we pray. Amen.
The lesson today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. Listen for the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and on the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was doubled and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself for, with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels." For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning and welcome. We appreciate so much your choosing to be with us on this third Sunday of Advent as we move closer and closer to the blessed event of Christmas when we celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world once again. As we uh, move deeper into this worship experience, I'd invite you to join me uh, for a few moments of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, we have observed a Sunday of hope in this blessed season. And oh, how very much we need a sense of hope when we consider uh, the spiraling increases in infections with the COVID virus. And as we hear and experience in our own circles of more and more deaths, among your people. We pray that you would continue to make us a people of hope, that you would grant us um, flashes, moments of your kingdom breaking in around us that bring to us an incredible sense of hope. And we also have observed uh, a Sunday of peace as we consider the events of the world around us. Again, we need not only around the world, but in our own nation, a deep sense of peace that only you can bring, an abiding peace, uh, a peace that is enduring. Today we look for a sense of joy. We need to experience a new sense of joy. And we need something to balance over and against the sadness and the stress and the difficulties that we have faced during 2020. Today we pray that you would Lighten the load for us. That You would lighten and lift our hearts in joy and in praise. We give You thanks this morning for Your church and for its enduring spirit. Even when things continue to happen that feel like setbacks, we know that You are leading us into a future that You envision. We pray that You would strengthen our fellowship and our commitment to each other. That You would strengthen the bonds of love between us and among us. We pray that You would help us experience a sense of the necessity of a loving Christian community around us. And we pray that You would bless us with that community here. We pray, O oh God, that You would be very much a part of every day's experience in this season. We pray that You would Help us not to focus on uh, a matter of lack, but of abundance. And that we would experience the joy of giving, not only to those whom we love deeply, and not only within our circle of friends and family, but that you would open our hearts in generous ways to the broader community among those who are part of the least and the lost. Help us to 
continue to see and experience your call and claim on us for mission and for ministry. Now we pray that you would uh, bring us a building sense of excitement and that you would bless us with your presence here in a way that is very real. Because this is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, typically at this point in our in-person worship, we would be receiving our morning tithes and offerings. And we invite you to be considering how you would like to live into um, your commitment to Christ and His church in this season. You have heard the Scripture lesson this morning from Isaiah 61. It really is a, a joyful passage of Scripture. You know, I could not help but think of the hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You know, it's not necessarily a Christmas carol or an Advent hymn, but it is one of the most beloved hymns of the church, typically used and sung during this season to express in ways that other hymns do not the joy that we experience as we pour out feelings of adoration upon God and Jesus Christ. And so it's especially appropriate for us to have sung this song today as we consider the text and as we consider that traditionally this is the Sunday of joy. You see, the prophet is so excited about what God has done that he, can, cannot, he cannot contain his joy. God has delivered his people and thus the prophet shouts for joy. And the sad fact is that not everyone could celebrate. The children of Israel prior to this morning, uh, the, to this moment, were in mourning. Doubt and despair had overwhelmed them. All of their social and religious activities were like attending a funeral. But this would all soon change for the children of Israel would be moving into a great celebration that was more like a wedding than mourning at a funeral. So why has this whole process begun? You know, why has this whole mood changed? It's because people are now rejoicing in their God. Why is there so much joy when before there had only been doom, gloom, and despair? It's because God has given His people a new status, which is highlighted by new clothing. For God Himself has put this new clothing on His people. God clothes the whole person, body, soul, and spirit with the garments of salvation and restoration. The children of Israel were back in their own land now, and this was indeed uh, a cause for um, just incredible expressions of joy. And the joy was expressed in the language of a wedding as the bride and bridegroom themselves are clothed in the garments of salvation. Oh, it's true that Israel had sinned and broken covenant with God. And yet... God has forgiven her sin and cleansed her soul. 
And this is the core reason for Israel's joy. The Spirit conveyed in Isaiah 61 is indeed a spirit of celebration which God desires not only for that time and that community, but that God desires for our community and for our church today. You see, the church is the bride, clothed in garments of righteousness and radiant with the glory of God. And when the church truly lives into this vision of being the bride, then we can sing with Henry Van Dyke, Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory and God of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. So melt the clouds of sin and sadness and drive the dark of doubt away. And giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. You see, friends, it's time for us to shout. It's time for us to shout, Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee. See, the prophet before us is shouting because of the joy of restoration. Some years before we came to Corinth, the town where we lived was a county seat town. And the old downtown was decaying in some respects, but it still had a certain charm about it. My favorite place was a table at the front window looking out to the south from a local restaurant there. The view to the south from that window was It was like looking at a Norman Rockwell painting before we left that town. You know, there was an amazing renaissance that began there. You know, on Thursday afternoons, for years, all of the business had closed at noon. But now, on Thursday afternoons, they had begun to reopen from 4 p.m. until 8. And once again, as it had been in years past, the town came to life. A friend of mine told me that when he was a boy, the downtown of this county seat came alive on Saturday instead of Thursday. Now, there were a lot of cotton growers around and bean farmers and You know, he said that when the farmers had finished their chores, they came to town on Saturday. And from 4 o'clock until 8 in the evening, the sidewalks and the stores were packed with people laughing and talking and shopping. Coming to town was a big deal on Saturday. Downtown was a place to share the latest stories. And it was a place to catch up on the news. And of course, news was code for the latest gossip. It was a downtown where people would hear the news of a new baby on its way or a person very near the point of death. You know, engagements were announced downtown by the simple showing of an engagement ring on a girl's hand. And the people sat on their cars. They stood next to the stores. They congregated in small eating establishments or stood in the aisles of the stores. And they would talk of life and death and the future. Teenagers especially made definite plans to meet downtown on Saturday. And many a courtship was carried out downtown. Neighbors would ask their neighbors during the week, are you going downtown on Saturday? And it was a real treat for a child to get to go downtown. Well, sadly, by the time we had moved there, 
much of that downtown existed only as a memory. Many of the stores and shops that had been frequented for so many years were now closed. And hardly anyone went downtown anymore. The town was moving west and everything was revolving around small strip malls and not many people were to be found on the streets around the square. And there's something sad about a town becoming deserted. You can easily find a place to park. You know, buildings are empty, beckoning someone to put them to use again or restore them to their original intention. You know what I'm talking about. You know, the Mississippi Development Authority, through the Main Street Projects, has seen great value in turning decaying trends around. And they've invested heavily in repurposing buildings and redeeming and renewing and restoring decaying buildings. Now, there's nothing there here, though, compared to the destruction and decay of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was deserted. The strong walls which had held back invading armies were now crumbling and had been pulled down for all practical purposes. The holy temple, the center of religious life and identity, the house of God, had been desecrated and was now only a shell. The Babylonians had razed the city and carried her city, her citizens off to a distant land. Now, after years in exile, the people are returning home to a land that was devastated. They were resolved to begin the task of rebuilding. But soon, cracks of doubt became evident among the people because of the perception that was growing that God was not really with them. And the people wondered if all the talk about God coming as a Redeemer was real. And what the people needed once again was this fresh sense of joy and of faith. Well, sometimes uh, we become so disappointed. and feel as though we have been devastated when we consider how long we were involved in the struggle to uh, get a new lease on life after a terrible fire here. You know, for so long we felt devastated and you know, the movement to becoming whole again has been so slow and you know, there have been so many differing opinions and disagreements about what should be done and how to proceed. We also need a fresh sense of joy because we are making progress. Sure, it's slow, but it's steady. And it's full of hope. You know, in chapter 62 of Isaiah, verses 1 through 3, we suddenly hear God's voice. God is no longer silent. And these three verses are a sign of a fresh resolve on God's part. That God will not remain silent. But God will remain active. And God will be engaged until Jerusalem has been vindicated and rescued from oppression. Friends, the message of Christmas, the message of Christmas, is that God has not remained silent. For in Jesus Christ, the silence has been broken 
And with the coming of Jesus, there is promise of restoration. And there's promise of renewal. And this causes us to respond, joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, O God. Just as the Sovereign Lord came to those surveying the ruins of their land as they returned from exile, so God comes to us who feel as though we have been exiled from God. It's His desire to make us whole and complete and to bring us joy, which is a product of His coming. Just as God desired to restore the joy of those ancient exiles, so God desires to restore our joy which has been stolen from us, it seems, by fire and pandemic. I'm reminded of British author and lay theologian C.S. Lewis, who in a landmark work entitled The Screwtape Letters, attributes the theft of humankind's joy to Satan, who is totally committed to our joylessness. Now, the screw tape letters are a series of letters from this senior devil, Screw Tape, to his nephew Wormwood, who is a demon in training. The screw tape offers a wide range of advice how to distract people from their turning to and coming to Christ, and how to keep those who have come to Christ from being effective and productive. In one letter he writes to Wormwood saying that joy is closely related to fun. And fun, says Screwtape, is closely related to joy. A sort of emotional froth, he says, arising from the play instinct. And fun and or joy have holy undesirable tendencies for us, that is, for screw tape and wormwood, such as promoting charity and encouraging each other and promoting courage and contentment and many other things that they would have considered evils. Screwtape continues, You will see joy among friends and lovers reunited at the eve of a holiday. And that joy is disgusting and a direct insult to the realism and to the dignity and austerity of hell. But God, on the other hand, God speaks to His joyless people and reminds them that they're not simply non-persons and that their future and fortune has changed. And suddenly ruins and destruction become an ornament in God's hand. And Jerusalem itself is a glorious crown, a sparkling diadem, a treasure, and a delight which honors God. These returned exiles will be a sign that God is indeed the sovereign King. And when you and I come back from our exile in that far country of sin, we too are a sign that He is King. Then, maybe rather than joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, we can more appropriately sing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Like those ancient exiles, Friends, we've been redeemed and we have been renewed and restored because God and Jesus, 
and the Holy Spirit are full of joy. And this joy is for you and me. Amen? And amen. Joy to the world. Please sing with us.